was awesome. I don't know if you heard that or not. That was really good. Um, I, uh, I have to say, I, um, my favorite part is when you guys sing your own songs. Whenever you take, I don't, I don't like, co I don't like copycat ministry. I don't know if that makes sense. I, I'd rather hear an indigenous sound. And so I feel like there really is something. Yeah, that was really good. You, that was really good. I don't know. There was a there was a moment there where it was just you guys, and it wasn't trying to be anything else. That was really awesome. I don't know if you guys could feel it. Could you guys feel how fun that was in the room for a minute, where it was just like, hey, this is just us. Yeah. We're not trying to be some other worship band or anything. That's, that was genuine. That was really good. I was really blessed. I like boo-hooed a little bit in the back. Oh, <laughs> you're so good. You're so good. Yeah, so, um, sorry. <laughs> I was really encouraged, though. It was really cool. Way to slow it down and just make people sing the same thing over and over again. Because that's all awesome. That's my favorite. You almost get like high, just like, yeah. <laughs> just keep saying it. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, okay, my name is, <laughs> sorry, totally out of order. Okay, my name is Tommy Green. I'm really, really stoked to be here. I'm so excited. I, I flew over yesterday um, from uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, where? Yeah, don't worry. Anyways, um, so we got here. I got here, and I was just like, I was shot, tired. Like, I, it, was, it was blowing my mind how jet lag feels, because I've never actually experienced that before. So anyways, I thought I was preaching last night. I literally thought I was going to preach last night, went to my, my caravan, got my stuff, walked back, and went, oh, what's up? Oh, yeah, when the show's done, we're done. And I sat in the back like, why? What? You're... Why did I do that? I have no idea. So anyway, so I like really started planning it out, and I have a good, I, hopefully I have stuff to say. Um, first off, I just want to say that um, I, I've traveled around, and I, I sing in a band, and if you know the band, awesome. If you don't know the band, better. Just because um, I don't do subculture ministry, I do kingdom. I, I'm not interested in creating more division, and I yeah. want to respect my indigenous sound. But at the same time, if you guys have your Bible, turn to Matthew 10. This is just a good place to jump off. And we'll jump there. I, what I what I don't want is um, the the Apostle Paul. He said, "I did, I don't just share a message with you. I share my life." And so I am not here to show up and be a speaker with that's afraid of his audience. I, I, what, what I'll tend to do is I'm, I don't know what is culturally okay. I don't know different, you know, there's different things that people find, you know, proper. There's different, like, lines that some people don't cross. I don't care. My doors and windows are basically open. What I used to be in my, in my former life was such a deceptive, abused liar that I have a tendency to be open to a fault. And my wife who's hot, she's not here, she's great, she's so, it's evidence that I pray, that's, that's what I'm saying, my wife, yeah, you can look at my wife and go like, how did that, okay, all right, there's a God, and he's good, look at this guy, like, it's just, it's anyway, so my wife, Chrissy, she is, she tends to be more of a private person, where I'm the type of person where I can, like, love a whole room, ha, ah, she likes people one at a time. And that's more her style. And, and I used to get in trouble with her because she's like, don't just go sharing all of your stuff. And I'm like, I don't have another speed. Um, I think people hide in general. And I think we're terrified to be fully known and fully loved. Okay. Anyways, here we go. Matthew 10. <laughs> so, um, all right. It's good. It's good. This is what I, where I wanted to start. I'm, what my, my tendency when I'm sharing, especially when I'm under, I, have, I don't want to take too much time for the sake of honoring just what we've got going on today. So I want to be really, um, I want to be like concise. What I probably won't do is go, hey, turn here. Hey, turn here. Hey, turn here. Because that will take up too much time. Okay, so just so you know, I do love the Bible. I read it. I like it. I underline it. My mom gave me a Bible for Christmas once. That was awesome. And I read it. 
Not really, I didn't read that one. But this one I read, and I've underlined it a bunch. Anyways, Matthew 10, verse 1. He called 12 disciples. Everyone say 12. 12. Cool. Gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Everyone say every disease. Every disease. And sickness. And sickness. Yeah. That's awesome. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who's called Peter. And his brother, Andrew, James, son of Zebedee. And his brother, John the sons of thunder, that tried to call fire down on people because they were racist. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. Everyone say tax collector. Tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the zealot. Everyone say the zealot. The zealot. Awesome. Thank you for reading that. And Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These are his guys, and this is what I want to say. Matthew was a tax collector. He was a snitch. He was a what, super grass. I don't know how you say it. He was a bad guy. He was a Jew that worked for Rome, stealing money from his own people. Yeah. Simon the Zealot wanted to kill all of them. <laughs> he was a Jew that wanted to overthrow the whole system. You have like a crust punk kid that's like, down with the government. And then you have a dude that works for the government, stealing from people. And Jesus is like, I don't care about your culture. I care about mine. Okay, so the reason that I'm here isn't to dishonor the fact that I am an American hardcore kid that's from a subculture scene. I don't care. I don't care. My, my uniqueness comes out now in context to everyone else. I can't stand at a distance from the rest of the church and go, well, I'm like a hardcore kid, so I do hardcore kid ministry. The, the idea is, in, in the midst of every good move, there's like a violent kind of like upheaval. You'll see it. When stuff needs to be defined, there's stuff that defines it. You guys are going to come out of the season where your culture has to define itself because the church won't accept you. And you're coming into a season where you will be accepted and you will be able to keep your own identity at the same time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. When, when we're really going to be after Jesus and not after our own little stuff, yeah. I'm amazed at how fast love just starts springing up around you. Yeah. So um, the reason that I say that is just to, to say Jesus is awesome because he picks these 12 people. And within them you have totally opposing worldviews. You have totally opposing styles. You have totally opposing political views. You have totally opposing people that ordinarily would hate each other. And he's like, cool, get along. Okay, so it's not to say that the church is right and we're just wrong. Because we're just like this orphan people that then they're just as wrong as we are. All right, anyways, okay, so here we go. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to share, share this story with y'all, if I could, and then I'm going to tell you guys uh, some stuff, and then um, my encouragement, my hope is that by showing up here, what, what I know that God has done in my life is he's, I get... My, the grace that's sort of given to me is I can give you a yes you didn't have before. Holiness, really, is the process where your yes gets louder than your no. And I can give you a bigger yes if you want it. Okay? And not only that, but I can impart a yes to you that'll be awesome because then you can give it away to other people. Okay, so like that's why I'm here. I want to give you guys a bigger yes to Jesus than you had when you walked in here. And I don't care if I literally pee all over your rug. I don't care. <laughs> I'm, I'm, the reason I say that is how well do you feel like culturally all this is working out for you? How many blocks do you feel as you try to pursue the kingdom? How hard is it right now? So let's talk about how, you know, Sometimes we're like trying to move stuff forward, and it's just weighted down because you got all these like golden calves. So I don't care if we just kick them over and knock them down. I don't care. 
If your culture gets in the way of the kingdom, screw your culture. The kingdom, period. That's it. Not your preference, not what you think is right, nothing. It's my responsibility to show up and go, I love you, and I got to kill you. <laughs> right? On some level. So anyway, so this is what, um, what I... Uh, okay, so I'm in, I'm in this goofy band, and we travel around. And this is why my goofy band worked. I got saved. Gosh, man. Okay. I got saved because when I was 18, I ended up having an affair with another guy's wife. I'm 18. She's in her early 20s. I was super flattered because she was hot. Wow. She was good looking. She was older than me. I'm this stupid high school kid. I have no idea who I am. And she like falls for me and I'm flattered. Okay. We hook up. Two weeks later, her husband commits suicide. Two weeks out of high school. His suicide note is like, hey, Tommy, look after her. So I went like all into this relationship. I gave up my integrity, my name, everything. I know what it's like to be like a David, is what I'm saying. You know, where he's like looking up and he's like, hey, God, have mercy. <laughs> that came later. But that whole thing of like, I know what it feels like to feel like the blood of another man is on your head. So I was not a Christian at that point. I wasn't interested. And after some time, what ended up happening was, this isn't, are you live streaming this? No. You're just recording it? What I tend to do is I'll give you enough information that if you wanted to, you could destroy me. Please don't. <laughs> okay? I don't have, like, enough shame to feel like I have to hide it, but please, for the sake of other people that are still alive. Yeah. Anyways, um... What ends up happening is we, we get married, we like try to make this relationship work. Um, we have a baby, and my daughter is now almost 14, which is just insane. <laughs> it's insane that she's 14. She's getting, she's like a person. She's like a whole human being. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, so it's, so anyways, there comes a point in time where we get married, um, St. Patrick's Day, 2002. We moved to Southern California. Our, within months, my wife falls in love with a friend of mine. And I'm like, oh, he sucks. I'm awesome. He sucks. You're, ah, ah. And she bailed. She just bailed. I watched it happen. I, my friends watched it happen. We called it out. And hey, she fell in love with someone else. Okay, stuff like that happens, all right? When you don't have the anchor that is the Holy Spirit, stupid stuff like that will happen to you. Because you're just open. Whatever I feel like. Like, you're just crazy. Okay, so I get it. But when I met Jesus, I met him in that season. Having done all of that and being allowed to live was a pretty cool gift. Because in the scene that I came from, at least in Salt Lake City, it's a violent place. The hardcore scene there is really a violent place. And in my eyes, when that happened, I should probably just kill myself. Because the only thing to do is, like, street justice. <laughs> he dies, I die. And so I went to kill myself, and I felt something say, don't. Like, everything you think you know is wrong. Can I change your mind? And I was like, well, you're probably going to have to hurry. <laughs> I want to let you know that that happened, and I did not get saved, not for years. Does anyone else here have a story where, like, you got saved, but you don't know when? Yeah. yeah. All of a sudden, you, like, have a different set of value system. You're like, I don't care about God at all. And then you look back, and all of a sudden, it's like a year or two later, and you're like, all of a sudden, now you care about what he thinks. Yeah. And you're like, what just happened to me? I don't know exactly the date. I just know at some point in the process of losing my wife that I had given up everything for, when I met Jesus, I met him as a bridegroom that had lost his bride. And I would wait up for her to come home. She'd go out with him, and I'd hang out with our kid, and I just waited for her to come home and just walk in and pick me again. That's all I wanted. Like, please pick me. He sucks. I'm awesome. Pick me, please. And I can't change her mind. The battlefield of the human heart. I can't. 
I can't do anything to make her love me. She's got to pick it. Oh, can you hear that? Yeah. I can't do anything to make you love me. You have to choose it. I can't coerce you. I can't manipulate you. I can't hurt you. My friends were like, we'll kill him. <laughs> I'm like, don't. And literally, they're like, we'll flip his, because he would ble he'd stay at my house. And I'm sleeping on the couch of my friend's house, and then going to work and coming back and trying to be with my daughter to try to keep her, like, sane. Sleeping in the back room of my own home so my wife can date my friend. Like, I'm just trying to be patient and wait. Just trying to be patient. Because if I can win her back, I win. That's what I want. All I wanted was her. Does this make sense, you guys? All he wants, all he wants is his bride to choose him. All he wants, and he waits, and he waits, and he waits, and they keep putting him off, putting him off, and he waits. Jeremiah 2. I remember how he used to follow me, is what he says. He used to follow me, he used to have the tender heart towards me. And then God says to people, what did I do? This is the heart of my God. So vulnerable to humanity. Blows my mind. Anyways, when she didn't pick me, she didn't pick me. Sucked. Sucked pretty bad. I waited for 11 months. My friends were like, well, flip his car over. Because he was parked in front of my house. And he had this stupid car that I hated. I hated seeing that car in front of my house. Oh, I wanted to punch his face. But I couldn't. I couldn't do it. My friends were like, we'll kill him. I'm like, don't touch him. As long as we stay right, they're wrong. The minute we cross that line, we skew. We skew it all. We just mess it all up. So... I, I leave, I take my kid, I go stay with my family in Atlanta for a couple months. I took, I took Mary and I was just like, this isn't going anywhere. That's where I took my ring off. It was after like 11, 11 months of waiting. And I was a train wreck and so was she. You gotta understand, we were both a mess. But the intention of my heart, I could see God looking at my heart going like, can you hear me yet? Does this make sense, you guys? Yeah. Okay, sorry. I just, when I met him, I met him as at the bridegroom. That language makes sense to me. He is real. Yeah. Whoa, yeah, he's real. His heart for people is so real. And he's so good, and it's romantic. Whoa. It's so good, you guys. So anything that would hinder you from feeling the romance of God, just call it what it is. It's sin. Okay? Anything that would hinder you from responding with romance, it's sin. Yeah. It's not strategy. It's not propriety. You're looking at someone that loves you more than anything, and you're going like, yeah, later. How many guys in here that are married have just wanted to make love with their wife, and their wife just wouldn't do it? And you're like, I'm going to kill everything. Fine. <laughs> just walk away. That frustration, that's what I'm saying. The, the father is like, really? <laughs> that's how I feel. Like God's looking at sinful humanity and going, if you will let me love you, you will be transformed. And we're like, I've got a headache. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like it's, more, it's like, yeah, you're crazy. That's what you're. You don't have a headache. You're nuts. Like you, you're blowing my mind right now. Like it's just, all he wants to do is all he wants to do is love us until we're transformed. He wants to be so good to us that we are so radically loved that everyone around us looks at us and goes, "There's a God, and He's good. Look at that." That's the blessing on Israel. That's all God wanted. I'll pick you, and I'll, I'll be so good to you that every other nation on the planet will go, I want their God. Amen. That was the point, and they couldn't do it. It's a tragedy, and now it's gross, and now it's behind us and dead. Amen. Okay, real quick, just to, on the spirit of religion real fast, okay? <laughs> if you, it, what, what's the law of Christ? Now that we're new covenant people, what's the only rule? Uh, I can hear it. Lo love one another as I have loved you. That's it. I just want to let you know, there are religions, there are Christian brothers and sisters that are going to heaven with us, that right now, they read the New Testament, and they see it as a new covenant, and they pull all the little rules out of the new covenant. And if you were really honest with yourself, have you ever done that? Shouldn't, I need to hope. I need to hope more. God, help me hope more. Oh, let no unwholesome thing. Okay, I can't talk 
bad. Okay, and you start reading the new covenant and you start making it a new list of rules that you have to start following. There's like 600 or so old covenant laws. Guess how many there are if you just took the New Testament scriptures and, and wrote them out. Like these are commands that we should probably follow. A thousand and fifty. That's what I feel like Christianity feels like to me. A bunch of people that say it's not rules, but we live like it is. Yeah. We're terrified that we're somehow going to break rules that don't actually exist in the new covenant. Does this make sense? Yeah. I'm new covenant people. The only thing that matters is love one another like he loves me. That, that's it. That's the law of the new covenant. Everything else is like, hey, do this so that you look and appear and show that you are blessed. That's, it's all just an outworking. But we try to, we literally live like we live under the new covenant law. We want to behave according to this book. You've got to stop doing that. Amen. Yeah. I mean, you, it sounds bad, but it's really not. I promise you it's not, okay? Okay. Are we good? Okay. So, <laughs> all right. Here's my encouragement, you guys. <sighs> yeah. Anyways. <laughs> we have to demonstrate the kingdom that we're a part of. We are actually a part of a new kingdom. And our, our mandate is that we would demonstrate the values of the kingdom that we're a part of. If you just, we are not just humans made Christian dwelling among you. We are now sharing in, we are the word made flesh. We're not just humans made Christians. We're literally now the word of God living among people. Not that we are God. He gives us the same nature that's within him. This is a lot bigger and a lot cooler than I'm a Christian and I sit in a church and I... <sighs> What I feel like is if all you want to do is be a Christian, just say you're a Christian and keep getting drunk and acting stupid and whatever you want to do because it doesn't matter. But it's not attractive. Who wants to be part of that kingdom? We just look like everybody else. And man, if I wanted to look like everybody else, I'd go do it with them. It's more fun. And a bunch of people that are terrified to really live, numbing themselves out on religion. You've got to be kidding me. So for me, my, my biggest thing is like, I am now sharing in a divine nature. I believe that God is good. Amen. I believe he's so good, so good, that I can actually break some rules. Meaning, even the religious ones that sound right. So when people look at me and say stuff about whether or not God heals, okay, the burden of proof is on you if you don't think God heals anymore. Because I've seen cancer disappear. I've seen broken bones mended. I've seen so much sickness just vanish. And I've seen a lot of people that I pray for not get healed. Oh! I'm saying it's his will. Why is it his will? Because it was decided on the cross, man. It's bigger than what you think. If it wasn't for all of it, the cross wouldn't exist. It does. So is his will in the matter settled? Yes. Is it my responsibility now to demonstrate that revolution in the earth? Yes. How many of you guys know there's laws in England and people break them? There's laws in the kingdom and people break them all the time. There are things that are allowed and things that are not allowed that people do anyway. Why? Because... Choice is more important to Jesus than control. Freedom is a better value system to Jesus than compliance. Do you under, I mean, freedom is so important. If I married my ex-wife, and the minute I put the ring on her finger, she had to do everything I wanted her to do when I wanted her to do it. She's robotic. There's no, what makes love so awesome what makes romance so hot is when someone that's so powerful who can say no says yes. I'm just saying as like a married guy, the hottest thing my wife can do, hottest, is say yes to me. Oh, because oh. she can level me with her. She's so powerful. She's, I've given her 
such authority in my life. She's an equal. I can, she's with me. And when she says yes, she's volunteering all of her strength and all of her love and all of her desire in that moment. That's the hottest thing ever for a husband. Husbands in here, you better start testifying, bro. You're going to be... <laughs> well, just saying. You get more of what you celebrate. That's all I'm saying. Very simple. You better start celebrating. I'm going to be... Um, going to be bombed. It's not my fault, okay? I'm, I'm prophesying right now, okay? Here we go. So... Hebrews, um, this, is, this is what I wanted to say. Again, I'm, I'm trying just to encourage you guys because what I feel like is um, there is definitely supposed to be a new season that drops on you guys where ministry and where the gospel and where freedom goes a lot easier. And if you're not ready for it, you're going to miss it and you're going to think it's still five years ago and it's not. Hope that makes sense. Okay, some of you guys that are like actually in the scene, I hope that makes sense to you guys. It's not five years ago. If there's one thing I've learned about eternity, it's that eternity is right now. Eternity is living forever in this moment. What's available in eternity in this moment? Everything. So I'm not waiting for nothing. Does that make sense, you guys? Okay, so Hebrews 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many, many times in various ways. Oh, that's cute. Huh. That's nice. I like that he did that. That's awesome. Okay. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. That's awesome. Who's talking now? Jesus, man. So <laughs> here we go. This is my favorite thing ever. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Hebrews 1, 3. Everyone just repeat after me. Hebrews 1. And three. and three. One more time. Hebrews one, one. and three. And three. And you just burn it in your brain. This is, I'm going to change your life right now. I'm just going to change your life right now. Okay. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. That, to a Hebrew, is like if you wanted to take all of God and carve it, into a person, all of God, Jesus. Who's the standard for your Christianity? Is it you, your doctrine, your theology degree? Who is it? Because it should be Jesus. Jesus is the standard. Jesus is what you look at, not where your church is, not where your discipleship comes. No. Jesus is the standard of Christianity. He's perfect Christ-likeness. He is exactly what you should be shooting for. Which means, what he does, you do. If you want to be a disciple of Christianity, keep going to church. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, you better start shooting for the supernatural. I hope that makes sense, you guys. I'm just telling you. There, there's like, let's imagine like this. Okay, I got a friend that says like this. There's the, there's the realm of the world. Then there's the realm of the church. Then there's the realm of the supernatural. Then there's the realm of the kingdom. And then there's the realm of the new covenant. And what you'll see is people get locked into one of them. Some people get locked in the realm of the world. And you're like, you just can't get them out for nothing. But they're killing it in the world. They're almost like an apostle in the world. And you're like, man, why are you so powerful in the world? Your system sucks. But they're, they're doing great. Then you've got people that they're so good at getting people from the world into the church. They're the leaders that you go, God, I wish that they would just, but they're not supposed to because they're actually gifted by God to get people into the body of Christ, right? Then you got people that they're in the body of Christ, but they're supernatural. And you're like, wow, sometimes you wish they would be a bit more something else. What you have right now is a lot of people from the supernatural culture, the prophetic or the healing culture that have realized that healing isn't just for the church. It's for the whole world. That's where we're at right now in America, in a big way. People are like, it's the kingdom. Kingdom is like this huge buzzword. It's all about the kingdom. It just means you take the supernatural, and it's not just for a church meeting. It belongs on the street. 
It belongs, as you sit and talk to someone, the Lord speaks and you share it. As you sit and you encounter somebody, you pray for the sick and they are healed right then. Like, it's that kind of deal that's like, it's out of the four walls. And we all desire that, but I'm just telling you guys, if you haven't prayed for someone outside of the church in the last week, that's the standard. You guys are the only standard that the rest of this country is going to have. So do you want to be proactive and go after that? Or do you just want to wait for other people to do it? Because the reality of the situation is, if you don't do it, it's not going to get done. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. The most important thing for me, though, right now, is to tell you guys, I do want to see you guys do ministry all over the place. I totally do. I want to see you guys absolutely kill it. I don't think that England is as hard as people make it out to be. I think that you guys have your own culture, and I don't understand it all. But unbelief is unbelief. Yeah. Arrogance is arrogance. Pride is pride. Just because it sounds different, it's got a funnier accent than mine, doesn't make it stranger to me. It's the same thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, unbelief is unbelief. Cool. Good thing Jesus is Jesus because he wins. That's just how it works. And I'm not, if, I, if I'm not intimidated by your lack of faith, if I'm not intimidated by your anger, which I'm not, if I'm walking with a level of revelation because he's actually encountered me, yeah. then I don't really care, man. Yeah. What are you going to do? But, but if you still have this fear on you of your culture, you, you, you've made an idol of your culture. Yeah. You've placed all of your belief in the power of man. It's really antichrist. You've got to repent of that. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Just call it what it is. It's a sin. That's fine. You're sinning. You're missing it. And I don't mean sin like you're just in open rebellion. Sin for a Hebrew is like you aim an arrow and you're aiming at the target and you loose the arrow and it just goes somewhere totally different and you just miss it. It's like you're doing the right thing and the wrong thing happens. It's like sin. You're missing the mark. I'm not saying you hate God. I'm saying you might say you're aiming somewhere, but you're hitting somewhere else. Does that make sense? So it's, I'm not saying, oh, you're bad. Sin. It's like, I don't care. Our heart, our ability to choose Jesus is so much stronger than the power of sin now. Yeah. It's, we're, we don't have to be afraid. Please stop being afraid of your culture. Your culture loves you. They just don't know it yet. Okay. Okay. Anyways, Hebrews 1.3. I, I don't know how much time I've got. When do I have to stop? What time is it? you got about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. So here you go. Here's a story for you. Um, God, there's a couple. Which one should I share? Oh, okay, I'll show this one. So I'm in, we're in New Zealand. We're playing the show in New Zealand. And um, this is what's interesting, is I'm going to say it like this, okay? Um, someone really close to me in my family just got hit back. I've been sharing this testimony and someone in my family, someone really close to me has just got hit back in the very area that I'm going to share. Okay? The reason I say that is because like I was sort of blown away and taken off guard with it and then I realized that I've there's been such a radical breakthrough when I shared the story. I'm like, no wonder hell is trying to hit my family back. I'm in New Zealand and um, we're playing the show and we're like, you know, we're doing a thing. Yeah, we're praising. Ow! Okay. And then I look in the back, and there's like this, it looks like a younger girl. She's jumping up and down. I'm having a great time. She's really smiley and grinning. And I'm like, ah, oh, it's awesome. So we get done playing the show, and we're in Wellington. And I, I go to the merch table, and I'm just sitting at the table ready to pray for people and talk to people and just kind of be there. I'm having a good time. And she walks up towards me, and as she's walking up towards me, with every step that she takes, I realize that, like, she gets almost older. <laughs> like... I'm like, oh, I thought she was like 18. And as she's getting closer to me, it's like, oh, maybe she's a little older than 18. Oh my God, she's like in her 20, oh my God, she's like, oh my God, she's like 40 years old. Like she, I, she just, I didn't realize it. And I go to shake her hand and she extends her hand and her arm is absolutely mangled. It's like almost deformed. She's missing skin. Like it looks like she has just sliced her arm up so many times. The scars are like, it just covers her arm. She's missing chunks of her arm. Like, she's deformed her body. And I'm like, go to shake her hand. And I'm like, oh, hey. And I see that it's on the other arm as well. So she sits down, and, and she genuinely needs prayer. We start talking. And, and here's the thing. When I was, like, four years old, I got molested by this babysitter. 
And I know that it marked a part of how I thought, what I thought about relationships. I know that played a part in how I conducted myself sexually. I know that that it ruined my ability to have healthy relationships in that, in that world. I think it contributed even to the choices that I made. It was a thief my whole life. So I hate it. I really hated it. I hate that it happened. I was really upset about it for a long time. I say that because she goes, yeah, like when I was younger, I was abused. And my heart goes out to her. Oh. And she goes, and then later on in life, I in turn abused other people. And my heart goes, <laughs> and I'm like, you stay away from me. Like in, in me, it was like all compassion. And then she's like, yeah, now I'm the bad guy. And I'm like, you jump out that window right now. If you keep talking to me, I'm going to literally, I will punch you out right like I was so upset in that moment that I was like oh, that's where I stopped <laughs> right and I'm like I, I don't want to have this conversation anymore I'm like literally shutting down <laughs> she's like talking she's crying she's open-hearted God's been ministering to her and I'm like I'm gonna kill you and light you on fire probably <laughs> like I'm so mad that I'm like uh-huh no 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 like and I'm like, God, you need to do this. Like, you need to do this right now because I cannot do this. And he's like, shut up and let me do it. <laughs> I just really got this, like, kid, I love you. I mean, he, he loves me. I'm literally, out of all of you, I'm his favorite for sure. So <laughs> I'm not worried about it. But, like, when he talked, it was like this thing of, like, you guys are his favorite. Okay. So, um, but anyway, so it's like one of those things where, like, he's like, you shut up. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. And I'm like, ugh. So I have to shut my eyes. I'm like, just stop talking for a second. <laughs> and I close my eyes and I hear him. He's like, you need to stop acting like you're the person that's in this room right now. And I'm like, oh. So I just tell her, I'm like, listen, um, I need you to close your eyes. And I'm, I'm supposed to just act like, I need you to stop talking to me like Tommy from Sleeping John is here. I, I just need to get out of this room. And I need you to stop for a second and just imagine that Jesus is here. And so she's like, okay. And the Lord says, <laughs> He's like, I want you to kiss her scars. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> what I did first was I was like, my wife, Chrissy's going to be so mad at me. <laughs> she's not. Like, she totally wouldn't be. But I'm like, God, no, I'm not going to kiss some other girl. And he's like, shut up. I mean, it was just like, you're so full of it. So I'm like, all right, well, I have to, like, I need to bless you. And so, again, I just need you to act like, instead of Tommy being here, it's like, Jesus is here. And so her eyes are shut. I'm like, oh. So I take her hands and I lean forward and I kiss her left arm. And she just immediately starts crying. And then I kiss her right arm and she lets this shriek out. And then all, it's like in the spirit, like all this stuff just breaks off of her. And she's just sobbing, like done for, like over. And I'm sitting there and in the natural, I'm still closed off. But the presence of God is just like going, going, going. And she is just losing it. And I can feel the ministry of Jesus. I shared that story at a camp. It was a camp for a denomination of kids. There's 300 kids at the summer camp. And they're a part of a denomination that does not believe that the Holy Spirit still heals. But they invited me to come. Because they knew that I was going to say that the Holy Spirit still heals. So I'm sitting in this room and I'm like, hey, how many of you guys have ever, how many of you guys have ever seen somebody heal before? And there's 300 people. Like two kids. Just like, just the weakest. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, who in this room has like been injured? Who in this room is in pain? And like 30 kids put their hands up. So I'm like, all right, cool. If, keep your hands up. If you're around somebody with your hands up, just put your hands on them real quick. So all these kids are just like, all right, put their hands on them. like, just declare the finished work of the cross of Jesus over them right now. And they're like, okay, so they do it. I'm like, cool. All right, who, who doesn't have any pain anymore? <laughs> 30 hands. <laughs> and everyone's like, whoa. And it's like, yeah, it's called the Bible. Anyways. <laughs> So the next, so that night is awesome. They like go off because I, I did a teaching with them on the seven Hebrew words for praise, which is one of my favorite topics. Um, because when it says praise the Lord, it's not a suggestion. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's like a command. And here's 
what's cool. You know when like you listen to like songs like dun dun, let your backbone slip. Dun, dun. You know those like songs where you're like getting instructed like tail feathers. You're like, yeah, that's the songs. The songs are like that. They're like praise the Lord, and they mean jump up in the air and spin around. They mean lift your hands. They mean get on your face. They mean freak out. There's a there's a there's a, you know hallelujah hallelujah, hallel, yah. Praise the Lord. Now, Yah is the Lord. Halel is to be boastful, to shine, to be clamorously foolish. It means lose your mind. Act stupid on purpose because God is so good. That's what hallelujah means. The next time you hear someone say like, praise the Lord, don't just go like, Jesus. <laughs> and don't stand there. Don't stand there. Church, please, for the love of God, don't just stand there. That's more unbiblical than looking like an idiot. You know what I mean? Which is me making you more religious about praise. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to do that. Like, you better follow the rules better. I'm just saying that those kids, kids lose their mind and people criticize hardcore kids because we're crazy and we like go nuts and people are like, what's up with that? It's like, we're actually more biblical in our praise than you are in yours. Our, it's like that thing. It's like we're expressive for a reason, and it's okay, and it's actually biblical. It's just that Psalms is one of the most underinterpreted book in all of Scripture. There's so many commands. Praise God, like this, a shigian off. And then you look at the bottom, it says probably a musical term. You think? <laughs> it's a song. <laughs> Dude, like, oh, anyway, so I share this testimony because... Five minutes, yeah, and then I'm laying in. I'm taking it down. Okay, so whew. I share that testimony because I, I talked about New Zealand. I share this story. The kids are like, what? And I'm like, well, who hasn't seen healing? Like, who needs to be healed? So all these kids get healed right in front of them. So the next morning, I have to leave, like at like 11. I have to leave. So I'm like, man, I got to go. Does anybody have a testimony that they want to share? Because then I can turn it over to them, and then I got I to gotta hit the road because I get to go back to the airport. And so these girls in the front are like, and they're like pointing at the friend. And I'm like, uh, yeah. So this girl comes down front. She's like, yeah, I just wanted to share this. Um, Friday night when I was on my way up to the conference, I cut my arms open. Yesterday before we came down to the meeting, I, they were still so bad that I put my sweatshirt on when I came into the meeting. And she's like, when I woke up this morning after they prayed for me, and she pulls her arm back and they're all gone. Like all these scars are just gone. So, <laughs> I've been at conferences and like festivals and Sleeping Giants played these shows and they have water bottles in these trash cans full of ice. Well, at this one festival, the ice melted and there was no water bottle, so it's just a trash can full of water. And I wanted to baptize kids and we're in the middle of a farm and there's no water. So I'm like, hey, if you want to get baptized, like meet me by the merch table and yeah. So I go to the back and I bring this big trash can full of water and like all these kids line up and we just start dunking kids in the trash can and baptizing these kids in the trash can. <laughs> And it goes like, it, someone made a video of it, and so then it goes viral, and people think we're the dudes who baptize kids in trash cans all the time. You know, that's not <laughs> but, but because of that, we did a conference, we were doing a show in Bogota, we're in this restaurant at a press conference, and, this, and these kids, the power of God hits this room, we preach the gospel to these kids, they get saved, I'm like, can you get filled with the Holy Spirit? All these kids get filled with the Holy Spirit, they start popping off. And then my friend, my translator's like, are you going to baptize kids in trash cans again? And I'm like, I don't want to do that, man. It's like, no, I think. And he's like, yeah, you should do it. So I'm realizing all these kids are getting saved. There's all this stuff popping off. And we should probably baptize kids because that's powerful stuff. So powerful. It's like Moses through the Red Sea. It's like, you know, you can just take them right through the water. Woo! Some crazy stuff's going to get cut off. You know what I mean? It's cool stuff. I'm, I'm a fan. So I'm like, sure. So they hook a garden hose up to the sink of the restaurant and run it out through the front of the building. And they give me like an orange Home Depot bucket, like a painter's bucket. And so we're just filling it up with water and dumping water over these kids in the middle of the street in Bogota, like 2 a.m. And like 60, 70 kids get baptized in the middle of the street. So I'm sharing all these testimonies with these kids that don't believe the Holy Spirit does stuff like that. It's against the rules. What about full immersion? I don't care. I don't care whether they go backwards or forwards. They went in. I don't care. <laughs> they were dry. Then they got all wet. And Jesus showed up. Like, I don't care. I don't care. Don't care. So I'm sharing all this stuff, and these kids are getting jacked. 
And then I talk about the seven Hebrew words for praise. And this girl's scars disappear. And I leave and hand the mic to the youth pastor, get in my car. And about 20 minutes later, they're like, yeah, the girls just baptized the girl with a water bottle on stage. Now everyone's going bananas. It's awesome. Okay, so here's what I'm saying. <laughs> We share that testimony. Well, then months later, I go to a different conference and I share not only the testimony of the girl from New Zealand, but then I share this healing testimony from this other girl. And I fasted for, for a while because I really, I was so disconnected that I really wanted to just be really close with the Lord on some level. So I fasted for a while before I went to the conference because I was really hungry. I wanted God to do something. And they gave me 10 minutes. I was like, I didn't have any time. So I'm like, God, you got to show up. When I'm there, I'm just going to let you come do stuff. You just got to, you got to do it. And that was it. Well, so then when I leave, I start getting all these tweets <laughs> from these people, and all of their scars are disappearing. Okay. What I'm saying is, God, God is not only the God that heals, but God's the God that removes scars. Amen. God's the God that looks at a scarred person, scarred people, scarred community, scarred history, and says, like, no more. Yeah. Yeah. God is the God that makes everything new. Practically, spiritually, theologically. This is Jesus. This is Christianity. Anything else is a really weak comparison. Yeah. People are going to change their mind and the sermons are going to go forth and people are going to be changed. But I'm telling you guys, what this, what this country needs is you. Just being free. That's it. To do something different than the culture. The culture doesn't get to dictate how powerful Jesus is. Okay, so you guys get to demonstrate that. I'm going to pray for you guys just for more of an encouragement and a boldness and just for some freedom to come this weekend. And just over the rest of the, the course of time as you praise and all this stuff, let's pray for breakthrough. I want you guys to really believe that God is bigger than you thought he was. Okay, and then um, we have another speaker. Yeah, where are you? Okay. it's going to be good. It's going to be good this afternoon. It's going to be awesome. So let's pray right now for just the spirit of God to keep multiplying what he's going to do in your life. Because it, this doesn't have to happen once a year. Okay, so, um, Father, in Jesus' name, God, I just ask right now, Holy Spirit, for your inspiration, for your fire, God, for your presence and your power, Lord, to absolutely flood these people, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the resurrection power of God that's within every single believer in this room. Thank you, Lord, that you have demolished the power of death in us. Thank you, Father, that you do miracles. Thank you, God, that you heal the sick. Thank you, Lord, that you bring dead men back to life again. Thank you, Jesus, that you deliver us from the snares of hell, from demonic oppression. Thank you, God, that you change our minds. God, we agree with repentance right now, God. We say, Father, come and change our minds. Come and change my mind right now. Change the way that I think. You change the way that I think, it'll change the way I live. Thank you, Father. You change the way that I think. It'll change the way I live. And I commit my heart to you right now. God, for every single one of these people, I'm just saying it again. We showed up. God, write it down on our books today that we came here to say, Jesus, we love you. We love you. We honor you as the King of Kings. We, we see you as the Lord of this nation. And we say, it's good. It's good, Jesus, that you are the King. It's such a good idea that you are the Lord of Lords. Well, that you are the commander of all of heaven's armies. So, Father, even in this moment, over this next little while, would you just dispatch warring and ministering angels to this place right now, God? Break off heavy, heavy shackles of addiction, of fear, of frustration, God, of pain. God, break off chains. In this, in this day, right now, God, come and begin to liberate people. Liberate people, God, from how they used to think, God. Just change the way they're thinking. Whoa, God, give them a bigger yes in their spirit that's like, no, God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than I can ever imagine. He's bigger than your prayer life. He's bigger than your dreams. He can do better than you can come up with. 